Please pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in each one of our hearts be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. For these last weeks in the Easter season, my sermons are focused on the five gifts that come from baptism. These are the five things that we, as people who join a church, either as adults by, by transfer or by affirmation of our baptism, that is confirmation, say that we will do as part of the response to the good news of our baptism. The one I focused on yesterday, last week, <laughs> yesterday, um, was, do you remember it? You don't have to say it out loud, just think for a minute. Do you remember anything from last week? I know it's hard, right? <laughs> to live among God's faithful people. That is to be part of the community that is the church, which is a community entirely different than any other community in the world. It is the community that begins with Jesus, life, death, and resurrection. And we are drawn together as church because of that. It's a community where everyone is welcome and where if you show up, we have to love you. It's a wonderful thing to live among God's faithful people. Today, I'm focusing on the second of the practices that flow from our baptism, the practices of a mature Christian life. To hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. To hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper. I've learned about the power of gestures from Nadia, to hear and to share in the Lord's Supper. When I teach this to the confirmation kids, I basically tell them, this means you'll come to worship and they nod and they will, they will, and they do. In many ways, preaching about coming to worship is preaching to the choir because you're here worshiping. You have just heard the word of God. And when we say to hear the word of God, we don't just mean to listen to scripture. We also mean to engage with scripture, to hear the preaching of the word and independently to study scripture on our own, to have scripture be something that's alive in our lives. And then we have communion, sharing in the Lord's Supper. These two things are related in that they are the things that we do when we gather as church and they're the ways that we are fed for our journey. We receive God's word. Think about that. We have a chance to hear from God. Think about somebody in your life who has maybe passed away or gone away, and then imagine what it would be like to find a letter from them, to come across an old email or a voice, to have one more chance to have a conversation with them, to hear from them. When we engage with scripture, when we read or hear scripture, we are hearing from God and God's very presence comes to us intimately. Now we know that scripture is not just one thing, right? Scripture was written over a couple thousand years. It has a bunch of different books written by different people at different time and different places for different reasons. And it's the fact that scripture sometimes contradicts its own self. So hearing the word of God is not just this passive thing. It's not like going to an advice column where you find some easy answer for the problem that you face. It is much more like having a conversation and developing a relationship, developing a relationship with God. You can hear from God. People sometimes ask me, and the confirmation kids almost always ask some form of this question, how do we read scripture? Do we read it literally? And I always have the same answer, and you've maybe heard me say this before. I always answer with an answer that I heard. The literal parts we read literally, the poetic parts we read poetically, the historical parts we read historically with an eye toward who wrote them and why, the letters we read as you would read a letter, trying to understand what was the issue, why was this written and who wrote it, and et cetera, et cetera. There is so much to learn about scripture. It's this in incredible gift. And it's an incredibly humbling thing to approach scripture, to be in conversation with God. I've spent the better part of decades, three decades, I suppose, at this point, 
reading scripture every day, trying to understand it. And the more I learn, the more I know what I do not know. It's the work of a lifetime. And it is amazing. I can't tell you how many times, I think it was almost every day, this past difficult year, that I would be facing something so hard. And then I would read a scripture and I would think, how in the world did that happen? That that exact scripture attached so perfectly to what was going on. This is part of the gift of scripture. It really is alive in that it speaks to contemporary issues and to the struggles of our very lives. And so it was with that kind of attitude of humility and amazement that I opened this passage and read from the book of Acts, this book that was given as what happened last week when the whole passage was on baptism without me planning that there would be a baptism. Today, the whole passage is on hearing the word of the Lord and sharing in the Lord's Supper without planning that ahead of time. Although you might not know that at first. You might not know at first that what was going on here was a debate about scripture and about communion. Here's what's happening in this passage that we read today from the book of Acts. And feel free to turn your bulletin to it or scroll back if you're at home. This is Acts 15. It's the middle of the book of Acts. This is the growth of the early church. Jesus has died, raised, and ascended. And now it's the people after him trying to figure out what does it mean to live in light of his resurrection? What kind of community? Paul and some of his followers, some of his helpers have gone around spreading the good news outside of Jerusalem. Peter too has been spreading the good news, not only to the original chosen people, but to new people who are attracted to this community of grace and love. And here's the issue. There's a group of people who have undergone a very particular ritual, the ritual of circumcision. And by their circumcision and by virtue of the women folk that they are attached to, they have created a community. And there is a very clear way that you enter this community. You get circumcised. And then there are all these people who never were circumcised who have discovered the good news of Jesus which is attached to the good news of that original people of the people of Israel, that there is salvation and that there is hope and that there is grace and there is a way of being together so that you can protect and love one another. And they want to be part of that. And so the question is not exactly, can Gentiles become part of the of faith, but how? How do they get in? Do they have to be circumcised or not? How could they belong to this community? And there's some debate about this. And the community, the council, the elders, they get together and they have this long, incredibly churchy kind of conversation, right? I read these, these councils from Acts and it gives me such, um, such courage about the work of the church. As we ourselves are in a position of thinking about our next council, next week we will announce to you who the slate of nominees are for the council and um, thinking about the very nitty gritty work of the church and how sometimes it happens that we have to debate kind of boring things like budgets and other times we get to debate things that are of real importance in the lives of our people. What will we say about racism? How will we respond to climate change? How will we feed our neighbors who are in need? This work of the church is never easy. And one of the lessons from this book of Acts is that the church has always had to take time to figure out who are we and how do we respond to the current moment? Our church has taken that time. We will continue to take that time. We are not a church that says one thing and then stops. That's not the church. The church is not a static community. It is a movement where people are coming and where we are spreading out to share the good news. Our youth are leading us, and I thank God for our youth. They are helping us know what is important to them so that we know how to proclaim it to the world. You'll see that they've started a mural on our garage, and if you're not here in person, next time you drive by, it will be done. It's not done yet. 
but they brainstormed with one of our resident artists, Marnie Marie, and another one of our artists, Hannah Cabetti, and they came up with this incredible design that incorporated so much of what they think God stands for. And it has to do with peace, and it has to do with the cross, and it has to do with inclusion for people of a variety of sexual expressions and gender identities. And it has to do with Black Lives Matter, and it has to do with care for creation. And it is an incredible expression of their vision and their hope, which must be our vision and our hope. And yet none of those things is easy for us to figure out. None of the, those things comes simply. And the question for us as it was for the people of Acts is, how do we be church together? The people of Acts went to scripture to solve this. And they noticed in scripture, there was not only this idea that God came for a chosen people, but there was also this idea from way back from Isaiah, that those people would be a light. That those people would not keep the good news of God to themselves, but would share it. This idea that Judaism was totally insular is just wrong. It was always meant to be a movement of God's people for their protection, yes, but also for the good But James points out in this passage from Acts, he goes back in this case to the Amos, which is one of the prophets of scripture, and he shows them, he shows them. This agrees with the words of the prophets. I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen from its ruins. I will rebuild it and I will set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord. Right there in the Old Testament. And that study of scripture changes their community. It cracks open for them God and God's word and God's presence so that they can include new people. And they decide about this, you don't need to be circumcised. And what that decision did, not only opened up the Gentiles into this community, it also helped women take on leadership roles when they couldn't before because there was a new way of belonging and it was open to men and women. These cracks happen in our scripture and they help understand how are we to crack open to the next thing that God is doing, to the next people that God is calling us to be in relationship with. And this is where hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper come together because what was at issue for these people was not just some theoretical, how do we be a community together? It was, who can we eat with? In this, who you ate with was a sign of where you stood in the society. You didn't just eat with anyone. You only ate with people who were your co-religionists or in your same ethnic group or social status or family. It was called table fellowship. And that's why, as Nadia pointed out, we her, but the scripture really speaks when our her sermon and my her time with children and my sermon map so perfectly. But as she pointed out, Jesus broke all sorts of rules because he ate with the wrong people. And what's happening here in Acts is they discover that they can be one religious community, Jews and Gentiles, is they discover they can share a meal together. Ranker, outside in the world and inside in the church. And at one point, one of the people who um, had some conflict with the direction of the church invited me over and they said the most beautiful thing. They taught me something so important that day. They said not, here's what I have a problem with or here's what you're doing wrong or here's what I'm sure is right. They said, I think we just need to connect. And then we sat down and had some cookies or something, there was some food and we just connected. And it was a beautiful thing. That connection that happens at communion, we don't say you have to believe X, Y, and Z before you can come. We say 
if you are hungry to be part of God's community, then come here. Come to this table and to that table and share in the fellowship that we have as God's people. Allow yourself to be fed, to become one community by the bread and the wine that you eat and that you share. As we hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, we realize we aren't God. And we aren't the people who decide what God's community looks like. There's a famous saying that says, God made us in God's image, and then we have spent our lives returning the favor. God made us in God's image, and we return the favor. Friends in Christ, if you have never been disturbed by something in the church, then you've probably made God in your image. If you've never grown in your own faith or discovered that you were dead wrong about something, then you maybe need to spend more time in scripture discovering the wild and weird people that God includes, the ways that God operates. It is surprising and humbling to every one of us, myself 100% included. And yet here is the gift. It's not because we got God right that we get to be part of God's community, but it's because God keeps speaking to us, keeps beckoning us, keeps feeding us, keeps shaping us, keeps forgiving us, and keeps calling us, that we get this great gift, this gift that is church, this gift that is one another, and this gift that is the calling to be a light to the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.